We're going to be going to the book of 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter chapter 2. Asher, where are your parents today? Uh, Japan. Japan, okay. All right. Today is his mother, Janet's, birthday. I don't know if she can get texts in Japan, but you could, <laughs> could say happy birthday to her. Uh, he's 29 today. No, I'm just kidding. First Peter chapter 2. Um, while you're finding that there, I was thinking as we were singing that last song, um, we, we promised as we sang that song never to murmur or repine. Now go home after church and look up what repine means. <laughs> I think it means we're not going to murmur and complain and be down in the mouth all the time. That's a good promise to make to the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength, isn't it? This morning it's a little bit different subject. It's the priesthood of all believers that I want you to look at today. A lot of Christians don't realize this, but God has made us as Christians priests, priests. And uh, as a priest, we have privileges. Uh, we can go directly to the throne of God through Jesus Christ, but we also have responsibilities. You know, that's, that's part of, of being a priest, priestly functions. Uh, God did not establish the difference that the world observes between priest and laity. Have you ever heard those, those terms? priests and, and lay people, you know, many churches have a, a group of folks they call priests who have power over those who aren't priests. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not the way the Bible spells it out. And, and I can tell you right now, uh, that's a man-made thing that is designed for wealth and power. <laughs> if I can decide whether you go to heaven or not, boy, you better pay me money. <laughs> you better do what I say. But that's not the way the Bible, the Bible teaches it. And that's what I want you to understand this morning. Uh, there's some real blessings in this truth from God's Word. I'm going to read um, quite a bit of chapter 2 here, starting in verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 2, and uh, verse 1. He says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. I'm going to stop reading there. The, the priesthood of all believers. Uh, this is an important doctrine, as, as any doctrine is. And this priesthood is based on our relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, he talks there in verse 4 about Jesus as the living stone. A and we use that expression, don't we? He's our rock. He's our, uh, he's our foundation. Uh, Jesus is the living stone. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, it puts it this way, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone. Uh, later on in verse 7, it says, the same is made the head of the corner. There's a, a scripture in Ephesians. You can uh, turn or just listen. Ephesians 2, verse 20. He says, 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation. And then it says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, now, did you hear that? There's a lot of words there. Let me read it again. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So he's the, uh, the living stone, as it says in, in Peter. We're the lively stones, <laughs> all right? Uh, and what he's showing here is the basis of, uh, of our beliefs. The basis of everything we believe is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation, and we spring out from him. Um, we're built up from Jesus. We're built up for service. And you probably know 1 Corinthians 6, 19, where he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Uh, we're God's temple. Uh, in verse 5 there of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Now there's more than one picture here. Uh, we can understand the picture of a foundation and a, and a building coming up off of a foundation. We've all seen that. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen buildings where the foundation had a problem and so the building was cracked. One of them was my son's house and at great expense uh, he had to repair that. Uh, you know, foundation makes all the difference, doesn't it? We understand that picture. But he uses another picture here as well. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. That idea of a spiritual house is more than just a building. If you were to look up the word house in your dictionary, at least in, in my old Webster's, uh, one definition is a family of kindred, especially a noble family or an illustrious race as... The House of Windsor. We've heard of that. In the Bible, you look it up, it's very common to talk about the house of so-and-so, the house of Aaron, or the house of Pharaoh, or the house of Moses. And it's talking about a family. And as Christians, we're built up a spiritual house. And it's based on our heritage. And our heritage comes from, uh, from Jesus Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. Uh, see, this structure, uh, like he talks about in uh, Ephesians 2.19, is the household of God. It's all believers. Uh, there's not l levels or layers of, of Christians. There's not super Christians and, well, you know, normal, everyday Christians. Uh, we're all one in Christ. We're all the same. Uh, when you come to, the, to, to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, you know, what nationality you are, what language you speak. We all come to Jesus the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We're all part of that spiritual house, a family of kindred. And because of that, we're a holy priesthood. Uh, there in verse 5, uh, we're a spirit, uh, built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. And the reason is, that's who we spring from. We spring from the great high priest. Now, the, the Old Testament example, of course, in, in Israel, I was just thinking about, that, about it this morning. Um, all of the priests were from the house of Aaron. So if you were a priest, you'd be talking to another priest, and he'd probably be your cousin. You know, they're, they're all related. Uh, we went to Fiji one time, and we were visiting a certain fellow, and it didn't matter who I talked to, it seemed like. I'd say, oh, we're, we're with Salve Sekela. Oh, that's my cousin. <laughs> that's the way it would have been around with the priest. And, folks, that's the way it is with us as Christians. You can go anywhere in the world, and you'll have a family relationship because it's the same. Every, everywhere you go, we're built up uh, the household of God. And the Bible says this is a holy calling. In uh, 2 Timothy 1.9, he, he calls it exactly that who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. See, one of the key characteristics of a priest, he wasn't doing his work. He was doing God's work. 
not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Uh, this is a holy calling. You know, that Old Testament priest was chosen, chosen by God. Uh, it was the house of Aaron. They were expected to live a holy life. Now, they didn't, though. If you read through Scripture, you'll see uh, there's, on occasions God would kill somebody for doing the wrong thing as a priest. Uh, they were given a job. They interceded with God for the people, and there was one high priest. And for us as Christians, that one high priest is Jesus Christ. We're of the household of faith. We're of the household of God. And because of that, uh, we're, a, uh, we're a, a royal priesthood in uh, Hebrews. By the way, it, Hebrews is a book in the New Testament that really helps you to understand how the old and new relate. Many of the cults take Old Testament truths and try to apply them today in a wrong way. But as Christians, the book of Hebrews tells us the reason there's a New Testament is because the old has been pushed aside. Now, it's the basis for the new. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 1, for instance, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. Uh, one that you're probably familiar with, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus is our great high priest. Now, we're, as Christians, we're priests. He's the high priest. And because we're priests, and because Jesus is our great high priest, we have privileges. There's things that we can do as priests that other people can't do. You, you may or may not remember the account in the Old Testament where Saul, remember the first king of Israel? He really felt like they needed to offer a sacrifice and he, he wasn't a very godly man and, and he was probably trying to do it as kind of a, something to get God's favor and so they could win the battle, you know. And he really wanted him to do a sacrifice, and Samuel, the priest, wasn't coming. And so Saul offered the sacrifice. Do you remember the account? And God takes away his kingship because of that. You see, that wasn't, he didn't have access to that. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't of the house of, of Aaron. But as priests, we have access to God. Uh, the beautiful picture in, in the Gospels and then repeated in the book of, of Hebrews is that God tore the veil in two. The, the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies, God, by his own hand, access, open to believers. That's uh, this is especially poignant uh, scripture, Hebrews chapter 10 and, and verse 19, when he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, <coughs> Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. See, that veil is a picture of Jesus being torn for us. And through Jesus, we have access to God. Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance. As Christians, we have access to God. In fact, the, the, the verse I read earlier, Hebrews 4, verse 14, talks about we have this great high priest and hold fast our profession. The next verse says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have access. And not only do we have access, but he understands when we come. Jesus has been through the same temptations you go through, yet without sin. See, he's the expert in dealing with sin because he wasn't a failure, he was, he was a success. And as we uh, think about this relationship uh, that we have as Christians, uh, we're priests because we, uh, we're of the household of God. And that's what our, our, our household does. And we can come boldly. We can pray anywhere, anytime, without human help. You don't have to go through me, I don't have to go through you. You know, there's nobody that has the right to say, oh, listen, tell me and I'll, I'll tell God. Uh, Mary doesn't have that right. Uh, 
I can't think of who else I could name. You know, I, I don't know what other religions believe, but uh, we go directly to God through Jesus. That's one of the reasons we pray in Jesus' name. We come because Jesus is the one who gives us access. And the Bible in 1 Timothy 2 says that Jesus is the only mediator between God and men. He says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Christ became that go-between. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So as Christians, we have access. What a blessing. I can come boldly to the throne of grace. You know, I, I don't have to make an appointment. I don't have to ask permission. He says, come in, son. Let's talk about it. As well, I have security. Look at verse 9 there of 1 Peter chapter 2. There's some wonderful things here, and uh, we, could, we could spend a lot of time. We're just going to look at it briefly, but he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Here's four things that give us security as Christians. One is we're chosen. <laughs> we're not wannabes. Now, do you understand that term? You know, there's people, who, oh, they want to be this and they want to be that. No, we are. We're saved. I, I see people wearing, oh, who's a popular sports person nowadays? It used to be Michael Jordan and, you know, different ones. They, they, on their shirt, it would say Michael Jordan and have his number. Listen, they're not Michael Jordan. <laughs> I've seen him. They, you know, he's not four feet tall and white. <laughs> uh, but as Christians, we're not just wannabes. We're not just wearing a, a label. We, that's what we are. We have security. God's chosen us. And he says it's a royal priesthood. This is not just any priesthood. This is, we're related to the king. He says it's a holy nation, a holy people. That's who we are in Christ. This holiness doesn't spring from us. It springs from, from God. Now Romans, for instance, he says, therefore being justified by faith. Justified means declared righteous. Uh, we've got to get our holiness from the Lord. And if we're his people, we have it. We have security. And then he uses a word that uh, a peculiar people. In our day and age, peculiar is generally used to mean odd. Now, we may be that too, but the word actually has to do with possession. We belong to the Lord, and God doesn't lose his things. Now, you might. <laughs> I might. Oh, man, I lose things all the time. So do you. Uh, God doesn't. God doesn't lose things. That's security. And the Bible even says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Boom. Uh, we have access. We have security. Verse 10, what a precious verse this is. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Folks, that's who we are. We're the people of God. Listen, when you talk about your people, it needs to be God's people if you're saved. That's who we are. We're the people of God which had, had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Folks, we, we have these the things that we need in Christ Jesus. We have identity. Like he said in, in verse 5, we're, we're a, a, a spiritual house. We're the household of the Lord. Now, what a blessing it is. But you know, as much of a blessing as it is, it's also a, a responsibility. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've stepped across the line. You, you've changed identity. You're no longer of the world. You're of the Lord. And God says we're, we're of his house now. We're not of the devil's house or our family or our nation or our culture. We're of the Lord. He's the king. He's the leader. And we have a responsibility then to, to live for him. You know, one of the most obvious things that came to my mind was one of the things the priests Old Testament had to do is they had to keep the temple clean. <laughs> there was a lot of things went on. When they had the tabernacle, you, you read it there in, uh, the, in the Pentateuch, there was a lot of work involved taking that tabernacle apart and loading it on, on carts and hauling it to the next place and putting it up again. Man, the priests did all that. They didn't just sit around and read. <laughs> they worked hard. Uh, and then when the temple was built, Man, they, there was a lot of work involved in that. And there are several times when you read in the Old Testament that they got slack. Under Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29, he had to have them clean the temple. Get that stuff out and get the right stuff in and get it right. They had to clean the temple. They, they'd not been doing their job. You remember Nehemiah? Uh, Nehemiah is such a character. Uh, in, uh, 
in my language, I'd say he, he was a real hoot. Uh, although I, you wouldn't have thought so if you were around when he grabbed you by the hair and said, come on, let's get this done. Uh, Nehemiah came and, and they, they, there was somebody living in the temple. What's this about? And he's an enemy of God. Let me read you what Nehemiah's solution was. It grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobias. When he saw this, we'll throw his stuff out in the street. <laughs> and then he said, and I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God, and, and so on. Uh, listen, we have a responsibility to keep God's temple clean. You remember Jesus? He cleansed the temple. And he was no sissy. Uh, when, when Jesus got after him, they ran. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Listen, if, if you're a priest and your body is the temple of God, we have a responsibility to keep it for the Lord, not just to use it any old way. We need to keep the, the temple clean. Jesus had to clean the temple. Our body is his temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then in, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, he, he uses the expression and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Have you ever thought about that, what that means? There's quite a few scriptures that talk about sacrifices. Um, and I don't mean the Old Testament sacrifices. For instance, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Uh, you might know that verse. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Listen, it's reasonable as a priest, as priests, as a holy priesthood, to keep ourselves pure for the Lord. It's unreasonable for us not to. Can you imagine going to the temple and all the priests running around all slovenly and their clothes hanging off and smoking and you know swearing and doing things like that? That would be unreasonable, wouldn't it? And as Christians... Uh, a spiritual sacrifice is to use your body for the Lord. Offer it to the Lord. Day by day, moment by moment. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse 16, I found this a real interesting one. Philippians 2 verse 16, he says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and I have Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. I find it interesting the way he phrases that. If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I think what he's talking about there is serving the Lord, but particularly in relation to other believers. Trying to be a blessing to other believers. That's a, that's a sacrifice. That's something we can offer to God. Listen, there's times when I'm sure that you'd rather do something else, but you have an opportunity to serve God. You have an opportunity to be a blessing. Take it. Offer that as a sacrifice to the Lord. That's what he's talking about when he talks about spiritual sacrifices as, as priests. In Philippians 4, verse 18 is another one. It says, I have all and abound... I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. So these are things that he's received. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And, and earlier you see, he's talking about giving. They had given and it had been a blessing. They had given to the Lord and it had been a blessing to him. You know, we talked about our missionaries this morning. Uh, we give and we're able then to give to, to their ministries and, and it's a blessing. We're able to see the gospel go on, just, just like the Lord said. Now, we need to be stewards of God's money. Listen, money will not stand the test of time. But what you do with it will. What was it uh, one man said? He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Listen, there's things in life, you're not going to keep them. You might as well give them away as an offering to the Lord. Uh, Hebrews Again, Hebrews 13, verse 15. There's a couple of things he mentions in two verses here. Hebrews 13, 15. This is, sounds like an easy one. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. 
Here's something we can offer to the Lord. Be thankful. Quit murmuring and repining <laughs> and be thankful. You know, in any situation, there's something you can thank the Lord about. Uh, we can offer that as an offering to the Lord. What a blessing. Well, the next verse, verse 16, but to do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Here's a spiritual sacrifice you can give. The, the word communicate there is the word koinonia. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's talking about the fellowship of believers. Uh, you can offer uh, just doing good and, and fellowshipping, being a part of, uh, of God's house. And, and the Bible says we do all this to the glory of God. Live your life for godly, eternal reasons. That's, that's one of the jobs uh, of the priests. Offer up spiritual sacrifices. Let me show you one, one more. 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 9. And there's probably many more you could find as you search the scriptures. But 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, I'll, I'll read it all again. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And here's the word that. Here's the reason why you're that that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. One, one of the things as priests we can do is show forth his praises. Just represent the Lord properly to the world. You know, as Christians, we should not be a drag on the name of Jesus. We should, we should promote his name. Uh, you're an ambassador. Listen, you're either a good ambassador or a bad ambassador. Uh, you're an ambassador for Christ if you're saved. You're a, we're a holy priesthood. Have a godly testimony. Live for Jesus. There's not two kinds of Christians. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I get people to think, well, uh, oh, you know, if pastor will pray for me, that, oh, boy, he, he's got an end with God. Uh, listen, uh, we all the same. We all go through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Uh, there, there's not priests and laity. We're just priests. I remember I was taking some kids to a youth group some years ago, and one of the boys actually attended Catholic Church. And I don't know how the subject came up, but it came up about saints. And I, he was sitting in the front, and I was sitting in the front, and I was driving. And uh, I, I said, well, I'm a saint. Boy, he looked at me. <laughs> well, listen, folks, that's true. As Christians, we're saints. But you know what? We're also priests. You, you think about that. That's a serious thing. Sure, there's privileges, but there's also responsibilities. And let me ask you this. Are you living and acting like the priest you are if you're saved? Are you keeping your temple holy? Are you promoting Jesus and, and praying for others? It's a serious business. That doesn't mean that, that I'm sure priests had, uh, had, had fun, but they knew that what they were doing was serious business. And we need to be the same. But you know, before you can be a priest, you need to be saved. Let me ask you that question. Are you saved? If you stood before the Lord and he, he said, why should I let you into my heaven? Listen, good works won't do it. The Bible says there's none good. The Bible says the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. He needs to be your great high priest and then you'll be a priest. <laughs> you'll have that access to God that, that you need. Uh, this morning, let me encourage you. If you're not sure about your salvation... Deal with that first. That's number one. And God has made it possible. He offers it to you as a gift. It's not hard for you. It's just by faith in what he's done and said. And then go on from there and, and just enjoy your relationship with him. Enjoy the privileges. Enjoy the responsibilities as priests and saints before the Lord. Let's go to the, to the Lord in, in prayer. With our heads bowed and in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you've not understood the seriousness of your relationship to the Lord. And let me encourage you. Um, thank Him. Ask Him to help you. He, he will. Lord, thank You so much for Your goodness. Lord, thank You that You saw fit to make a way for us to know You. Father, that You would send Your Son, Jesus Christ, that You would become flesh, that we might have a mediator, the God-man, that we could go to you. Lord, I pray if there are any here this morning that are not saved, oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move amongst us. Lord, that we would not refuse you or reject you. 
I pray that if there are those that are lost, that they would trust you today. God, help Christians to understand the honor it is to know you and to serve you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.